Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And in the last lecture of EC 3400 Analog Electronics, we looked at the voltage gain transfer function of an op amp in an inverting amplifier configuration when the underlying op amp had frequency dependent gain. And in this lecture, I would like to take a look at the input impedance of such a circuit. But before we talk about the non-ideal case, let's talk about the ideal case. So if we assume that we have infinite gain over the infinite range of frequencies, then the negative feedback results in the voltage at the positive terminal, which here is ground, being copied at the negative terminal. So from the point of view of the voltage source driving the circuit, it just sees a resistance R1 to ground, and it doesn't know about what's happening to the right of the line I just drew. So in this case, the input impedance is just R1, and you could do this without any detailed circuit analysis. Now, a more realistic op -amp model would presume that the gain is both frequency dependent and not infinite. And as in the previous couple of lectures, we're going to assume that we can use a first order low pass model for the frequency response. So I'm letting capital A here represent our frequency response represented in the Laplace domain. So if you plug J omega in for S, you get the frequency response. Now, this is the way Marshall Leach usually writes it in his notes. I often like to multiply the numerator and the denominator by omega naught to write it in this form, but you can use whatever form you like. Now, I'm still going to assume that we have infinite input impedance on the original op amp, so no current is flowing through the inputs. And I'm also going to assume that we have zero output impedance, so our voltage output is a perfect voltage source. You can tweak our analysis to include these effects, and you wind up with a more complicated analysis and more complicated formulas. But I don't think the resulting formulas are that illuminating, so I won't get into that kind of analysis here. Quick note, you're actually watching a revised version of this video. Everything you've seen up to now is from the original video, but now we're going to shift gears. Okay, so I want to compute the impedance looking into this direction. And the way I did this on the old version of the video is I fixed a voltage source here, VI. I computed the current flowing here, and I divided the voltage by the current to find the input resistance. And I computed this input current here in a pretty brute force kind of way. And that's the way Marshall Leach computed the input impedance of this configuration in his online notes on the topic. But someone left a comment here on YouTube noting that there is an easier way. You can compute the input impedance here looking into the negative terminal of the op amp and then just add R1 to that. In addition to being overall easier, you can use a Miller's theorem argument on this kind of configuration here that gives you a lot more intuition than the brute force approach. So let's use the same setup we used in the Miller's theorem lecture. I'm going to place a voltage source V1 here and then find the induced current I1 here. Now, of course, the voltage at the negative terminal is going to match V1. If you haven't seen my previous lecture on Miller's theorem, I recommend going back and watching that for context, but it's not strictly necessary to understand this lecture. In that original lecture on Miller's theorem, I just had a constant gain A here for the op amp that was not a function of frequency, and I had a capacitor in the feedback loop instead of a resistor. Okay, let's compute this input impedance. I need to compute the current here, I1. I'm going to notate that over here using uppercase letters because I'm going to indicate this in the Laplace transform domain instead of the time domain. So this is consistent with the notation that I use in 3084. Don't get my use of capital letters here confused with, say, bias voltages and currents as I have previously in 3400. Also notice that I'm not bothering to write S in parentheses for the voltages and the currents. I'm doing that to try to keep the notation concise. So now I can just substitute minus A times V1 in for VO and write this expression here. So to compute this input impedance looking into the negative terminal of the op amp, which I'll call Zn prime, I just divide the voltage and the current. 
And that winds up working very nicely because the V1s here cancel, and I just wind up with RF over 1 plus A. So I can take this impedance ZI and prime and just add it to R1 to get the original impedance we wanted looking into the non-inverting configuration. So, substituting that expression in for Z and prime, I wind up with this expression. And at this point, I'm going to substitute in our specific expression we wanted for our low-pass response for our amplifier, which is given by this. It has a cutoff frequency of a mega naught. And now I'm going to do a series of algebraic steps that seem unmotivated. It looks like I'm making the expression more complicated. So, first I'm going to divide the numerator and the denominator of this fraction by RF. So I wind up with an RF down here and an RF down here. And in this expression here, I'm going to divide its numerator and its denominator in order to get this expression here. And finally, I'm going to divide the numerator and denominator of this fraction by A0 in order to write this expression. And actually, I could have divided the numerator and the denominator by a naught and omega naught at the same time. I just found it easier to think about it one at a time. Now, why did I do all that? Notice that this term here now has the form of a parallel combination of impedances. Okay, that ends the new content, and now we'll return to the original video material. So let me define a resistance R2 as RF over A0. So that corresponds with this spot here. Now, S corresponds to an inductance. So let me define an inductance L as RF over A0 times omega naught. So that corresponds with this here. So I can rewrite our impedance as R1 plus 1 over 1 plus R2 plus LS plus 1 over RF. And this expression lets me express our input impedance as an equivalent circuit. So I have R1 in series with a parallel combination of RF, that's this here, with R2 plus LS. So that's a series combination of R2 and this inductance L. Let's think about some limiting cases. First of all, notice that as A0 goes to infinity, our inductance goes to R1. So I can see that in the equation by saying that as A0 goes to infinity, this term here goes to zero. And as that term goes to zero, this term would go to infinity. So this term will go to zero. It's like Russian nesting doll equations. Matryoshka, I think they're called. So you wind up with R1. But you can also see this by looking at the circuit. As A0 goes to infinity, R2 goes to zero, so this shorts out, and L goes to zero, so this shorts out. So basically RF is shorted out, and you're just left with R1. Okay, now let's forget about letting A0 go to infinity and just think about what the impedance looks like at a frequency of zero and as the frequency goes off to infinity. So if I plug in J0 for S, I wind up with this term here going away. And then I can take this subfraction here and multiply its numerator and denominator by A0. So the A0 goes up here. And then I can multiply the numerator and the denominator of the main fraction by RF. So the RFs here go away, and I wind up with an RF here, which gives me this expression here. Now, if on the other hand, I were to plug in J omega for S and let omega goes to infinity, then this here winds up going to zero, and then this goes away, and I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by RF here. So this goes away, and I wind up with an RF in the numerator there. So I wind up with R1 plus RF. So that tells us that this impedance is going to have a Bode plot that looks like a high shelf. Recall a previous lecture in which we discussed a cool theorem 
that lets you find the formula for the impedance of a circuit in a form that's amenable for making Bode plots. We discussed that theorem in the context of RC circuits, but conveniently it also works for RL circuits where you have one inductor and however many resistors. So RDC is the impedance at DC, and if I wanted to compute that from the schematic, I could say, okay, well at DC the inductor is going to look like a short, so I would have R1 in series with RF in parallel with R2. Now spelling out the parallel combination explicitly, I have something like this, and I can take my expression for R2 and plug it in here, and if I do that, a bunch of the RFs cancel, and then I can multiply the numerator and the denominator of that fraction by A0 to write RF over A0 plus 1. Then I, of course, have this R1 in front. And this is the same expression we got on the previous slide from analyzing this formula here. So that was all basically just a sanity check. Okay, so let's talk about the time constants. Now in RC circuits, we have time constants of the form RC. In our L circuits, the time constants take the form L over R. Now the overall approach of the theorem is the same. We're going to imagine using a couple of wire clippers and clipping out the inductor and replacing it with an ohmmeter to see the resistance looking out from the terminals of the inductor. Now, to compute the time constant associated with the zero, we essentially leave the edge here open. So when I use my clippers here, basically R1 is dangling, so it might as well not be in the circuit. So I'll see R2 in series with RF to this ground and back to the other side of the inductor. So I'll have R2 plus RF in the denominator, and I need to remember to multiply by L. Now for the zero, that's a little bit more complicated. I need to short the ends of the impedance I'm analyzing. So I'll basically short this to the grounds here. All right, so now if I look out from the inductor, I'll have a formula that's basically the same, except now RF is going to appear in parallel with R1. Now to make a Bode plot, it's convenient to think about this expression in terms of corner frequencies. So I'm going to take our time constants and invert them in order to write something like a pole frequency that's R2 plus RF over L, and our zero frequency is going to be R2 plus RF in parallel with R1 over L. So that's just the reciprocal of the time constants. And I'm just rewriting the formula up here in terms of these corner frequencies. Now remember, R2 and L aren't real. They're just part of this model that we made up. So if I substitute in our definitions of R2 and L, I can write something like this. And let's see, oh, this is nice. The RFs all wind up canceling. And let's see, I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by omega naught. So I'll wind up with an omega naught here. And let's see, I can also multiply the numerator and the denominator by a naught. So the a naughts will go away here, and I wind up with an a naught here. So that should look like this. So that's a nice compact expression. And let's see, I can make the same substitutions for R2 and L for the zero frequency. And here I'm going to explicitly spell out this parallel combination. And basically a lot of the same transformations can take place. So I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by A0. So I'll wind up with an A0 here. This RF and this RF cancel with this RF. I can multiply the numerator and the denominator by omega naught. And that all should give me something that looks like this. So it's a similar sort of expression, except I have this R1 over RF plus R1 factor here. So these are the corner frequencies for a Bode plot. And that Bode plot is going to have a high shelf kind of form. So at DC, it starts at R1 plus RF over A0 plus 1. And this A0 plus 1 means that the impedance at DC is less than the impedance at infinity, which is R1 plus RF. And also, if I look at the formulas here, it's obvious that omega Z is less than omega P. So this has this high shelf kind of form. 
So on this kind of impedance plot, we're imagining that the current is the input and the voltage is the output. Okay, so big picture. If we have a perfect op amp, the ground here gets copied to the negative terminal and the input impedance is just R1. But if the op amp isn't perfect in terms of not having a perfect voltage transfer function, and in particular, if it has a frequency response specified by this transfer function where you can get the frequency response if you plug J omega in for S, then from the point of view of some circuit that is trying to feed this amplifier fragment we have here, it looks like it's feeding this combination of resistances and an inductor. If you have any thoughts about the practical consequences of the input impedance of the circuit looking like this, please let me know. I don't really have particularly good intuition about this, and I would like to change that. I'm going to leave up my original video. I'll add something like old version to the title, partially because it never hurts to see alternative ways of deriving the same result, but mostly because there's a lot of really excellent comments on that video that provide intuitive explanations of these results.